Okay, uh, we're going to continue on here. Uh, so we've been talking organic chemistry, and we got into obviously uh, deep into sort of naming uh, of our alkanes and also our cycloalkanes. And again, as I talked about, there are uh, several different sort of names that we come across in organic chemistry. And most of the time, sort of the official way of naming is the IUPAC way of naming. Um, and again, um, those are usually the rules you follow with most organic compounds. There are several or a lot of organic compounds that do have some historical names that, again, they still use. Also, uh, just some common names as well. Uh, but I would say most of the time you should shoot for the sort of IUPAC way of naming. Remember that pretty much uh, no matter what we're naming, uh, we are always going to really start with looking for that longest uh, continuous carbon chain. And remember that when you are counting that longest continuous carbon chain, you want to make sure that you do uh, sort of look at all of your options, uh, not just go with whichever one kind of looks straight across as uh, that may be the longest chain. But remember that it could go straight across, go up, go over and that type of stuff. So as we did in a number of examples, you know, I kind of went through, uh, you know, all the possible longest chains and you do want to find whichever one is the longest. I would recommend, though, if, if you do happen to have the one that goes straight across and that is the longest, and even if you have another one that maybe goes up and around, uh, maybe just take the one that's straight across is sometimes the better way to kind of see everything else. It doesn't really matter, again, for example, if you went straight across, there's five, or you went straight, then up, there's five. It really doesn't matter which sort of five you choose as your longest carbon chain. Uh, you really should end up with really the same name regardless of which one you choose. So you don't have to always take the straightest one um, in that case. When you do, as we saw, that pretty much will match, hopefully, one of those uh, 10 alkane names. And that really is going to be kind of like the base of your name, whatever that last 10 alkane name is. Now, what you want to look for after that is groups that are attached. And we talked about groups. And there are carbon-based groups, which are known as alkyl groups. And alkyl groups are, as I mentioned, carbon-based. They are also pretty much based off of the first 10 alkanes. The difference is, as we talked about, they have one less hydrogen. And because they have one less hydrogen, that allows them to attach to the longest carbon chain without giving carbon too many bonds. And we do actually name those sort of carbon groups just like we would name uh, the alkanes, except we drop the A-N-E and we do replace it with Y-L. So if we have like a CH3 group that instead of methane will be a methyl group if we have two carbon groups. Instead of ethane, it will be a ethyl group and so forth as you go down the line. We also saw a couple of uh, special sort of groups. And probably the one most often you might come across is uh, this one here. And again, that is based off of three carbons, which is propane. But remember, we also talked about ways to classify carbons. And you could classify a carbon based on how many carbons it is directly attached to. So if it's attached to one other carbon, then it is a primary carbon. If it's attached to uh, two other carbons directly to it, it is a secondary carbon. And if it's attached to three other carbons, it's a tertiary. As I also mentioned last time, sometimes people will tell you to count hydrogens rather than carbons. I personally like to count carbons because whatever number of carbons you count is what the classification is. So if it's attached to one, it's primary. If it's attached to two, it's secondary. If it's attached to three carbons, it's tertiary. If you count hydrogens, you have to go the other way around. It's attached to test three hydrogens, it's primary, two, and then one would be tertiary. So um, I like to count hydrogens, our carbons, much better than hydrogens. Here, the attachment is at the secondary one, and this is not a regular propyl group. This is an isopropyl group, and it's that iso part is kind of that CH3, CH, CH3 arrangement that you see a lot. We also have our halogens, which are named like fluoral, chloral, bromo, iota there for any of our halogens that might be attached as well. Once you identify the groups when we're doing alkanes, we do want to number the chain. And we do want to, to give uh, the groups the smallest number. 
So when we're dealing with alkanes, it's the actual groups that are attached that really do take the priority in terms of which way you number the chain. Basically, you have usually two options. You're kind of left to right or right to left or you know up and down or down to up, depending on which direction you're sort of going. And we do want to go whichever one uh, gives those groups the smallest number. And it is as simple as like the first number there is smaller than the second number if you go the other way. So it is that simple as that is going to be the smallest set of groups. Once you do lock in that numbering, you do have to keep the numbering for everything else that's there. So as sort of you lock it in, all the groups are attached that way. Lastly, we uh, basically go groups in alphabetical order. Ignoring though uh, any prefixes that may be there, we did a couple where we had say dimethyl because there's two methyl groups, or if you have three methyl groups, trimethyl. Um, so we do ignore those prefixes and we also ignore numbers. Sometimes people go, well, this guy's got a larger number, so it shouldn't go first. Uh, but we do go by alphabetical force first, regardless of the number may be larger than the next guy's number. Um, that's all okay. Uh, we put it together and we get our, obviously, alkane name. Uh, we talked about uh, cycloalkanes, basically uh, sort of named the same way. If you have just one thing on the cycloalkane, one group attached, you really don't have to give the number for it because wherever that group is located uh, will be considered carbon number one. Uh, but if you do have a couple of things on there, you do need to give some numbers. And again, you probably would want to start numbering out whichever one alphabetically would come first and go left or right in the ring uh, to get you to your numbers. We finished up there kind of previewing a little bit of alkenes and alkynes. And these are organic guys that have functional groups of double bonded carbon and also triple bonded carbon happening there. And these guys are also named pretty much the same way. Um, again, though, we do give priority to where the double bond is located or the triple bond is located. And when you get to roughly about four or more carbons, uh, you do have to give the location of where that double bond or triple bond is located. And again, it gets the priority. So when it comes to sort of numbering, when you're doing an alkene or an alkyne, you want to number whichever way will give that double bond or triple bond the smaller number. Once again, once you lock those guys into place, uh, you basically will keep that numbering for everything else that's attached in terms of groups. The groups would be uh, named in alphabetical order, just like you would do with your alkanes. Thank you very much. Alkynes, uh, same deal. Triple bond gets priority. The difference is instead of A-N-E, uh, these guys will end in E-N-E. And instead of A-N-E, like our alkane, they will uh, end in Y-N-E. Any questions on some of that stuff? We're going to do more of those, obviously, today as well. Any questions on that? All right, then let's continue on. Let's talk a little bit about properties. Just kind of finish up our talk about alkanes. So we kind of jumped ahead a little bit there at the end. Um, as we talked about, alkanes are basically uh, nonpolar molecules. They're carbons and hydrogens, most of them. Um, and they have some different sort of physical and solubility properties based on what's there. Alkanes with one to four carbons are typically gases at room temperature. Uh, that's your methane, ethane, propane, and butane. Uh, that's because really these guys are definitely nonpolar. And what they will be using in terms of their intermolecular forces is those dispersion forces. And that's the way they interact with themselves. And that's pretty much the weakest sort of molecule, the molecule interaction you could get. And that's why, again, you don't have to look at it too quickly. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of convincing and it will just kind of break apart from each other really easily. And that's why we normally find these guys in gas phase. Now, when we got five to eight carbons, they're highly volatile. Volatile means, again, if you look at it wrong, it's just going to go into the gas phase, basically. And at room temperature, they may be liquids, uh, but they are very volatile. Like I said, a lot of times when you work with organic things, they put you in a fume hood because even though your solution may be a liquid, if you leave it out, it's very, very easy for it to just break down by itself and go into the gas phase. And a lot of that stuff is flammable, which is not good if you got a Bunsen burner down the road there as the gas is going down the bench. 
Um, and a lot of those guys are used for fuels, right? Octane, right? Four dollars, five dollars a gallon, whatever that octane may be. Uh, nine to seventeen carbons uh, will typically have a higher boiling point, and these are things that are found in motor oil, mineral oil, and jet fuel. Um, they will typically have a higher boiling point because although they are held together by dispersion forces, which are relatively weak, the strength of a dispersion force actually increases with molar mass because there's a lot more electrons, a lot more interaction happening. So these guys that are a little bit larger, even though they're still held together by that pretty weak force, will actually be a sort of stronger weak force than the other guys. And they'll have a higher boiling point and stuff like that. Uh, alkanes above 18 are parafilms, waxes. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. And you could have some, uh, again, 25 or more sort of uh, carbons as well. That is essentially how they make all this stuff. Uh, basically, these things come in really long carbon changes, chains, carbon long chains there. And uh, they do, I was referred to as cracking. And they basically, much like it sounds like, they crack it up into smaller pieces. And smaller pieces gives you different things like waxes, uh, fuel, and so forth. Um, and that's how they kind of break that stuff up. The solubility and density of alkanes, because they are nonpolar, they are going to be insoluble in water. Again, water being polar will want to use hydrogen bonding as its main source of interacting with other molecules and itself. And hydrogen bonding, again, is a bond between hydrogen and, and nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So in order for something to do hydrogen bonding, uh, it has to have a hydrogen that is directly attached to one of those three elements, like we see in water. This hydrogen here, or this hydrogen, is directly attached to an oxygen. The reason for that, if you look at the periodic table, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, upper right of the periodic table, those are the most electronegative elements. And when it combines with hydrogen, it creates a really polar bond. And that will make the hydrogen side more positive, the oxygen side more negative. And intermolecular forces, how molecule one molecule interacts with another, either the same molecule or a different molecule, they all interact again as a reminder, very simple interaction of the positive side of one molecule is basically attracted to the negative side of another. So when somebody hydrogen bonds because there's like a positive side and negative side, that's attracted to something else. So when we have something that's nonpolar, like a lot of organic molecules, they basically do not have a charge. There's no positive side. There's no negative side. Because as we talked about when we did bonding, if something is nonpolar overall, they are sharing electrons equally. There's an equal distribution of electrons over the entire molecule, which doesn't create like a positive or negative side. So the only way this guy here that's nonpolar, like a lot of organic molecules can do it, is it has to do those dispersion forces, which means one to two things typically has to happen the electrons in it needs to kind of go one way or the other. And if it does, again, it will temporarily uh, basically have a charge and temporarily it's able to interact through that. And that works temporarily, for example, with things like water. Uh, but over the long period of time, it will not be able to maintain that interaction. And that's very different than a polar molecule. A polar molecule means that it always has a positive side and a negative side, which means it's good to go to interact. It's always got a positive and negative. It doesn't have to wait for something to happen like nonpolar guys uh, to sort of make that interaction sort of occur. So um, over a long period of time, they will not be able to sort of keep that connection alive. Again, sort of like your salad dressing, if you mix it up right, it mixes. But because a lot of that's oil-based and water-based, over a long period of time, they can't maintain that interaction. If you look at the bottle after it's just been sitting there a while, everything starts to separate out. Again, I think we just talked about why oil, if you have an oil leak there in the ocean, starts to float on the top of the water because they can't mix, basically, and they will just kind of separate out. The reason they can mix for a short period of time is because basically everybody could do dispersion forces, even polar molecules. So for a short period of time, they could do that, but they kind of lose out over a long period. They can't basically do that and keep that interaction going. Um, typically, they are less dense than water. So if you have a test tube that has an organic guy in it and a water layer, the organic layer is usually the top layer. 
and the bottom layer is usually the water layer when you have that. They are typically very flammable, and again, they're found obviously in crude oil. Now, alkanes undergo a couple of types of reactions, and one reaction we've talked about previously, and that's a combustion reaction. And remember, if you take an alkane and you react it with oxygen, you will get CO2 plus water. And obviously, you'll get some flame and some heat coming off of it. That's, again, essentially what happens when you light a Bunsen burner, right? Gas comes out, give it a little spark, and mixes with the oxygen in the air, and it ignites. So alkanes will go through this organic combustion reaction. They also will go through another type of reaction. And here's the combustion of butane, which is basically the same idea. This is how you know it's a combustion reaction, an organic combustion reaction. You typically have O2 on the left and CO2 and water is typically the products that are always made in an organic combustion, unless you have an incomplete combustion and sometimes you'll make carbon monoxide instead of carbon dioxide. But most of the time you see those three things in a reaction, it definitely is gonna be a combustion reaction. So propane again is a fuel. We wanna write the equation for propane. It basically is CH3, C8 plus O2, again, a little CO2 and go that way, water. Obviously, we would need to do a little balancing like we've done before, a little three there, a little four there, six and four is 10, and a little five there, I think, and make sure that it is balanced at that point. Now, here again, uh, before we get into that, let's talk about another type of reaction that actually alkanes undergo. I'll do it here, actually. And alkanes in, are in organic chemistry in general. Uh, there's a couple of types of reactions. There's a lot of reactions. But the two that we oftentimes will sort of come across in this class in terms of reactions are either substitution reactions are reactions that are referred to as addition reactions. There's also elimination reactions and some other types of reactions as well in organic chemistry. But in a substitution reaction, uh, pretty much it is what the name sounds like. What happens in that type of reaction is a hydrogen, for example, with an alkane, uh, will get substituted for something else. So something will come in, something will come off, and they will basically kind of switch places. So if you took an alkane like this, a little ethane, and you reacted it with something like, say, Br2. This is going to be basically a substitution reaction. And in this particular case, all these hydrogens, they're essentially all the same. They're all equivalent to each other. So when you do this reaction, you could actually choose any hydrogen you like. But what's going to happen is the substitution part, which means a hydrogen will go off and one of these guys will go on. And basically, as we'll see in a number of reactions or equations that we look at, uh, nothing else changes. So when you're drawing sort of the products of reactions, it's really important to uh, not get over creative with it, I guess is a word. So don't get over creative with it. Not all kinds of weird things happen in these type of reactions. You'll be very surprised that very small things happen in these reactions. And the nice thing about that, frankly, is everything else remains the same. And what I mean by that is, typically speaking, if I looked at this, I pretty much have my product pretty much drawn for me. I would just draw everything exactly the same, except for the hydrogen I'm going to take off and I'm just gonna replace it with the BR and nothing else fancy happens or anything like that. You're just gonna basically take one hydrogen off and put one of these halogens on. Now, mind you, this hydrogen came off, which is technically H plus, and if you got one BR, that's technically BR minus. So that's where the other two things come together and they make something like HBR, a hydrogen bromide as well. So those guys will come together as well. This is what is sometimes referred to as being mono-substituted, where basically we just take off one hydrogen. If you let it go all day, they'll pop off all the hydrogens pretty much. If you do the right conditions, you can let it go, and you can pretty much pop off all the hydrogens and replace them all with bromines. 
But usually in this case, we're just looking for the mono substituted. Does it matter if it's a uh, ring type structure? The answer is no, it really doesn't. Uh, so if you did the same thing, this is a carbon here that technically has two hydrogens off of it, right? To give it four bonds. Same thing's gonna happen. Hydrogen's gonna pop off. This guy's gonna come on. And again here, nothing else is gonna change except that we popped the bromine on there. And again, we would get HBr. So this is the other type of reaction that alkanes will undergo. It's what's referred to as a substitution reaction. And basically, we're just going to pop off a hydrogen and put one of those guys on that's uh, reacting with it. Everything else remains exactly the same. So for example, on the bottom there, the ring does not open up and become straight, a straight chain or anything like that. With people do that, a lot of times people see a ring and all of a sudden like, uh, must be really complicated, must open up and do all these weird things. It does not. So as we will see in these reactions, as we talked about, pretty much there's a functional group, and that's pretty much where all the action happens. Everything else in the molecule basically stays the same. Any questions on those reactions there? Yeah. So we talked about that. So let's officially talk a little bit more about alkenes and alkynes. So as we talked about here last time, Alkenes have the functional group of at least a carbon-carbon double bond. Alkynes have the uh, functional group there of the triple bond. These guys are what are referred to as being unsaturated. Remember that a saturated hydrocarbon is pretty much all single bonded carbons and they have the maximum number of hydrogens that each carbon should have. When you add a double bond, as we talked about, essentially you do have to lose two hydrogens, one from each carbon in the double bond. So if you had our single bond here, In order to make a double bond between it so it does not have too many bonds to the carbons, we got to get rid of a hydrogen at each, and that would make our alkene. And if you wanted to make a triple bond, you would have to remove two more hydrogens, and that would make our triple bond, which would be our alkyne. So again, every time you sort of lay up another bond between two carbons, it is at the sacrifice basically of two hydrogens, one on each of the carbons uh, that are basically making the double bond or the triple bond. Any questions on that there? Now, uh, they contain double bonds and triple bonds, as I mentioned before, they are unsaturated. And there's also a, a sort of a consequence of the double bond and triple bond in terms of the geometry as well. And in terms of the geometry, when we look at our double bond, for example, here on either side, actually, it has, when we look at it, one, two, and three electron pairs, and it also has three bonds, and that is our trigonal planar geometry. So unlike an alkane that has tetrahedral geometry, here we have that trigonal planar geometry, which is our triangle, right? So it's basically our triangle that happens. So because of that double bond, we also get a different geometry that occurs. Um, we also get a, a different geometry that occurs with our triple bond as well. Um, so ethene here is the simplest alkene you could have uh, because you can't double bond one carbon, so you need two. So that's the simplest one that you could have. Again, we drop the A-N-E off of the alkane name and replace it with E-N-E. Here with ethene, we do not need to give any number for the double bond because, frankly, uh, there is only one place you could put it. It has to go between those two carbons. So there's no mystery as to where that double bond would be. So you do not need to give the number. Again, as I mentioned before, usually about four or more carbons you need to start laying up some numbers and stuff like that. Alkynes have that triple bond. And also because of the triple bond, there is also a change in geometry that occurs with it. 
And uh, with that being said, when we uh, look at this guy here, has one electron pair. And again, the triple bond counts as only one. So that is two electron pairs and two bonds. That has the geometry of linear, basically. So linear, 180 degrees. Now, this also does affect, technically speaking, if you were to draw a line structure where we have tetrahedral geometry, which gives us that zigzag shape for our alkanes, technically speaking, when you get to something like a triple bond, you would flatten it out. I don't really care if you flatten it out or not to show the geometry. It is perfectly fine with me if you want to lay up a triple bond like that with the wrong geometry. I'm okay with it if you're drawing line structure. But you will see sometimes people draw the line structure and they're kind of straightening out the linear part of it where there's the triple bond and do a little bit different with the double bond. So technically speaking, that's why you'll kind of see it uh, sort of leveled out. But for us in here, I am perfectly fine if you're drawing a line structure and you need to put a double bond, you just do it like that. Or again, if you need a triple bond, just do it like that. I'm okay with it. Uh, you don't have to kind of flatten out to sort of geometry or anything like that. Any questions on that? Speaking of that and line structure, uh, when you do have a triple bond, say like this, that's flattened out, people always miss carbons. There is a carbon here and there is a carbon here. And sometimes when people see it in a line structure, they miscount it because it's like straight. And they just think it's all one thing going into the other. So remember that if you have that triple bond on opposite sides of the triple bond, there are carbons sitting there. And that's a very common mistake. People will go through this and go, maybe count one, and but not the other. And they'll kind of miscount how many carbons you got going on there. All right. So as I mentioned before, we did some naming last time. So why don't you give this go uh Identify these guys as an alkene or alkyne, and while you're at it, why don't you give it a name? Okay, so let's take a look. Uh, first off, uh, the first one is an alkene or alkyne. It is an alkene. It's got a double bond hanging out right there. So the first thing we want to do with really anything that we name is just find that longest continuous chain. Remember that when you, though, are dealing with double bond or triple bonds, when you're counting the longest chain, it has to include the double bond or triple bond. So you can't miss it. So the longest chain has to include the double bond or triple bond as being part of it. Uh, so in this case, it looks like, like straight across here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Eight is based off of octane. Since it is an alkene, we drop that out and we do a little octene in this case. We do need to give the location of the double bond in this case, again, because you got about four or more carbons happening here and it could be in multiple places. By the way, there's no other group attached in this one, right? So it's just the eight carbons basically in a row. So here we do want a name. And again, we, will, we do want a number and give uh, the numbering we go left to right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. We could also go right to left a number, which would give us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Which way should I go, left to right or right to left? I should go this way, right, which is left to right. And that is because that will put my double bond at carbon number three. By the way, when you are counting the numbers, it is the first carbon that the double bond connects in you want to use. Obviously, if I went the other way, it would be number five, which is larger. So this is the way we want to go. That is what we need to insert into our name. And the three here is, again, not for a group, but it's for where on that longest carbon chain you actually have the double bond located. Any questions on that? All right, the next one is an alkyne, as we see a triple bond happening there, right? So uh, we got an alkyne here, right? And again, if we want to name this guy, we're going to go longest carbon chain is how many? Six. Any other numbers? Seven. Any other numbers? Eight. Are we just counting at this point? Nine, ten. All right, one of those I think is right. Let's see. 
So let's go uh, just straight across. So that is carbon number one, right? Carbon number two is right about there. Yes. And then carbon number three is right there. Carbon number four, carbon number five, carbon number six, carbon number seven, and carbon number eight in that case. The other option would be one, two, three, four, and come this way, five, six, and seven. Yes. Now, could I number or count this way? What would be wrong if I did this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. What's wrong with that eight? I missed the triple bond. So you got to have the triple bond in this case as part of the longest carbon chain uh, or a double bond as well. It needs to be part of the longest carbon chain. So they got to be part of it. All right, so uh, I think eight was a winner. Was eight a winner? I think that's what we have. It. Yeah. So uh, we'll get rid of these guys here. One, two, three. And this is what I was saying earlier, kind of the, uh, the carbon there on the other side of the triple bonds, very commonly missed. A lot of times people will kind of roll from like here to here and just go, oh, it's all just a bigger sort of line. So again, don't forget the little guy on the other side of the triple bond, which is a carbon. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, still going to be based off of octane, but this will be octine. We could probably imagine at this point where our triple bond should be numbered going left to right would definitely hit me a one, and we're not going to beat it going any other way. So that's going to be a one, a two, a three, a four, a five, a six, a seven, an eight. That's going to be a one octine. In this case, though, we do have a group hanging off of here, right? We have basically this guy, which is a group. And that is how many carbons in that group? It is one, two, and three only, right? This guy is not part of the group, right? Because that's the carbon that's part of the long chain, right? So we can't count this guy as part of the group. This is basically where it's attached. So one, two, and three. So three carbons is based off of propane. And because it's a carbon group, we drop the last part, and that's going to be our propyl, YL group. And we already numbered it. It is at carbon number four. So this would be four propyl, one octine, right? Other couple of things that we talked about last time that's important, a dash between a number and a letter or a letter and a number, you should have a dash. And again, as we had in a couple, I think we did last time as well, if you have two numbers in a row, they are separated by a comma. So comma between two numbers, dash always between number to letter or letter to number, whichever way. Question on any of those there? Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, say it again. Uh -huh. Exactly. So that's what that number means. It's, it's the carbon, which is this carbon. That is basically where the triple bond is located. And that's the same thing as we had up on this one. The three in this one is for this third carbon, and that's where the double bond is located. So because pretty much, like I said, when you hit about uh, four or more carbons and you have a double bond or a triple bond, what that does is it gives it uh, multiple places where the double bond or triple bond could be. And as we talked about last time, naming is just about telling people exactly where you can find things. So because there's like an opportunity where maybe this triple bond in another molecule is not on the first carbon, but maybe it's like way back over here and you need some way to tell somebody, hey, in this case, I'm talking about the one where the triple bond's on the first carbon and this one I'm talking about when it's like on the fifth carbon and stuff like that. So that's why when there is basically four or more carbons, there are multiple options where you could double bond or triple bond. You have to tell somebody basically where they're at. That's why when you have only like two carbons, there's only one place you can put it, double bond or triple bond. It's between those two carbons. So you don't actually need it and stuff like that. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, so we kind of jumped ahead. So we uh, we did these things. So again, um, when we name alkenes or alkynes, the priority in the numbering does switch to double bonds or triple bonds. Uh, cyclic alkenes are named uh, very much like cycloalkanes, 
But there is a difference in terms of when there are things attached to it. So, for example, this guy here with no double bonds is our cyclopropane. Now, if we lay up a double bond in there, it is now cyclopropene, E-N-E, -E, yeah? And um, again here, we uh, don't need an actual number for where that double bond's located because wherever it's located, it is considered number one because there's nothing else really attached. Now, if you did have, for example, uh, something attached, and uh, let's just say we had, let's say we had, um, say we had this guy. And we'll lay us up something there. And, And you put it right there. We'll do this. So we'll do something like this, right? All right. So clearly the longest uh, chain here is the ring. And that is five carbons in that ring, right? So that's based off of pentane. It's a ring structure. So that's based off of cyclopentane. And there is a double bond. So finally we get to our friend cyclopentene, E-N-E -E at the end, right? Since we have that double bond happening. So now we need to give the location of our group that's hanging out there. This group is a methyl group, right? Remember in line structure, you got just a line with nothing at the end of it. It's a carbon that will have three hydrogens, which is a methyl group. Once again here, we really do not need to give uh, the location of the double bond because wherever it is, it is going to be carbon number one. So for example, this is carbon number one, R, I'll go down here inside. That would be carbon number one on the other side. Now the goal here in this case is we actually wanna give the group here the smaller name since we don't have to worry about numbering the carbon or the double bond. Now, your instinct would be, which way should I go to get this guy the smaller number? If I go here and I go right to here, that is only one step away, right? So that would be like carbon number two, and that's a small number. The problem with that is you cannot do that because when you have a ring structure, like a cyclopentene or some type of cycloalkene, when you number the carbons to find the groups that are attached. You actually has to number through the double bond, which means that if I were to start at this guy as carbon number one, I would have to go through the double bond, which is in this direction, and that would be carbon two, this would be carbon three, this would be carbon four, and this would be carbon five going in that direction. Now, if I chose the other side of that double bond as carbon number one, we'll, go, we'll make it red. I again cannot go this way because I'm missing the double bond. I actually have to go this way, which would mean that would be carbon one, carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and that would then be carbon number five. So in this case, the proper number for this guy would actually be which number? Which one's the smallest? It is three. We would want a number in the red direction. We are going through the double bond and we're getting the smaller number. And if this would be three methyl cyclopentene. So although it may be tempting just to go, can I just leapfrog right there? Those IUPAC people say, no, you cannot do that. You got to go through the double bond. So you could thank them for that. Uh, but you do have to go through the double bond. So if you do have groups attached, you do have to give the number. The number is based off of basically where the double bond is located in the ring. And you got to start at the double bond. And again, you can just try both ways. And But you got to go across the double bond when you're numbering. And whichever way will give you the smallest. Obviously, if we had something else attached, say another one there, then that would be like a three, four dimethyl happening if we had something else attached in that case. Or if it wasn't another methyl, but it was say a CL, 
you would go for chloral 3-methyl uh, cyclopentene in my case. Again, still alphabetical order for our groups. Any questions on that there? All right, so why don't you try that? Why don't you also, uh, let's try these guys. Why don't you also draw, actually no, it's, why don't you do these guys? Why don't you give these? Okay, so let's take a look and see. We'll start on the first one here. Uh, we'll count up some carbons here. And uh, I think, We'll go uh, one, two, uh, three, four, and five. You could also get five if you kind of go the same direction and then down this way as well. So again, you could kind of choose either way on that case. Um, I'm just going to take the straight one since that seems to be the longest. That means we do have a group that's there, uh, which would be uh, this guy right there. It's our group. So we got uh, eight, not five, eight, one, two, three, four, five is kind of like eight, but not. Uh, we have uh, pentene, E N E, as it's a double bond happening there. Uh, we do want to number uh, our chain to give our group the smallest number. If we go left to right, that's a one, two, three, four, five. We go right to left, that's a one, two, three, four, and five. I should go which way? It should be two. Again, the double bond here takes the priority when we have a double bond or triple bond. So going in this direction gives our double bond a number two. Obviously, going the other direction, it's a three. So this would be uh, a two pentene. Because we locked into place numbering in this direction, we have to keep it for everybody else. That means uh, looking here at carbon number four would be our methyl group that's hanging off here. So that's a little four methyl uh, two pentene. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> all right, uh, looking at the bottom one, looks like straight across should give us all the carbons we need. We just want to make sure perhaps we don't miss any, right? So that's a one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, five carbons, six carbons. Yeah. So again, don't miss those ones on the triple bond where it straightens out. Uh, that is based off of hexane. It's a triple bond. So that's going to be a hex sign, Y-N-E. And you can probably just see, looking at it, if you go right to left here, I think we're going to hit our number that we need for our triple bond there. It's going to be the smallest, so this would be a 2 hex I. Any questions on any of those there? Coming to the guy atop, that is our cyclopropane with a double bond. Uh, go up here. So that's going to be uh, cyclopropene. We have a chloral group that's attached, and we do want to give it the right number. So we do have to start numbering at the double bond, which is either here or here. And in this case, again, we have to go through the double bond, which means if I start here, that's one. That would be two, and then that would be three. If I start here, that would be one to two, and then to three. So no matter which way you go in this case, it actually should be like a three chloral cyclopropene. Why can I not just go one, two? Yeah, I missed the double bond going that way. So again, when you have a double bond in that ring structure, you got a number through the double bond to get to the other side, basically. Any questions on that there? Okay, lastly here, whatever I drew there as I was just drawing things. <laughs> I think uh, I think the longest carbon chain here is uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, you also could get seven if you did this one, this weird thing I just made up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, out of those two options, I'm going to take the straightest because... The reason I wouldn't take the other is uh, it will create you a group that probably doesn't exist since I just made it up. So this way you will get one that does exist. 
So that is going to be uh, two, four, six, seven carbons, and it does have a triple bond. So that is going to be a hep tine, right? Y N E. So we'll go uh, there. We want to number it. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. If we go the other way, uh, one, two, three, four for the triple bond. So that's going to be obviously larger than three for the triple bond. So we will number this way. Gives the triple bond the smaller number of three. So a little three heptine. We then have a two carbon group, which is a ethyl group. And we have a chloral group here. Since we locked in that numbering, our ethyl group would be at five and our chloral would be at six alphabetically. Which one should come first? The chloral should again, even though it has a larger number. So we're gonna go alphabetical here. So that's gonna be a six chloral, five ethyl, three heptine on whatever I just made up there as I was drawing, yeah. Any questions on that there? So when um, applying a number, you always want the double bond for the triple bond to have a smaller number? Yeah, so unlike alkanes, so in alkanes where they're all single bonds, there is no double or triple bonds. So when you're doing alkanes, which are single bonds, it's the groups that take the priority. But once you start moving into like double bonds or triple bonds, they take the priority in terms of the numbering. And you do want to always go small, basically. You always want to give it the smallest number. And once you lock those in, everybody else gets locked in in terms of the numbering in the same direction. Backwards, right? So when we see hexene, uh, the hexane part of it really uh, tells us it is six carbons, right? So that again is where you want to start with. It's just the six carbons. The ENE tells us that it is a double bond. And the two tells us that it is at carbon number two where the double bond's located. Once again, since you are drawing it, you could go left to right or right to left in terms of your numbering. For me, again, I'm going to start here on the left and call that carbon number one for me. If you did the opposite side, that's perfectly fine too if you wanted to put the one on the other side. That would mean for me, carbon number two would be right next door. And that is where I should have my double bond happening. That basically takes care of that part of the name. That also means that the only thing left now is really a methyl group that's at carbon number four. And once again, since I started as one here, for me, four would be right about there. And it's a one carbon group. And now at this point, again, just like anything else, we're going to put hydrogens in to make sure everybody has four bonds, all the carbons. So the guy at the end needs three. Guy here needs two. This one has three lines coming in. Spread out a little bit. Got one. This one has three lines coming in, needs one. This one also has three lines coming in, just needs one. And uh, this guy here at the end would need three. The H on the other side, maybe. Question on uh, that one there. You weren't out to do line structure, but basically you do the same thing. You would just start with your one, two, three, four, five, and six. You would go carbon one and two, put a double bond, and then go carbon one, two, three, and four, and put a line, and you would have your line structure, basically. Yeah. Any questions on that there? All right, same thing here. We're going to go uh, backwards here. Octane, which is right about now. I'm regretting it. Uh, that is eight. One, two, three, four, five, uh, six, seven, and eight. Whew. YNE tells me it's a triple bond and it's located at carbon number three, which is what the three means. So again, I'm gonna go left to right, calling that one. So that's two. So my triple bond should be right about there. And again, once I sort of lock that into place, I'm going left to right. At carbon number six, I will have a two carbon group, which is our ethyl group. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. I'm gonna actually go down since I drew that structure there. 
you could go up is perfectly fine or down, whichever way you want to kind of draw it. And again, if you're not sure about the hydrogens, you could leave them to the end too and put them in. Um, and then at carbon number five, there's a chlorine, which would mean one, two, three, four, and five. And again, I'll go up with that one. Why not? I'll try to squeeze them in. There you go. And at this point, everything left is going to be hydrogen. So we will need three because he has one line. Two lines is two hydrogens. This guy's got three lines, which is one hydrogen. This guy's got two lines on the bottom and three, one hydrogen there. This guy right here next to it, the triple bond is, has four, so it doesn't need any, nor does the other guy. Guy next to it will need two. And lastly, the guy here will need three. Any questions on that? Yeah. Uh, uh, you, you mean like, uh, you came and then you, you triple bonded up. Is that what you're talking about? And then did you put a C there? Yeah. And then you kind of continue on with the rest of it and you kind of did this, uh, uh this still. The only thing that went up was the triple bond. Okay, so you did uh, you did something like this, and then you continued on kind of that way. the The problem with uh, that would be um, you continued down or to the right, or you went down this way. So the prop the problem with that would be uh, most likely. Uh, you might not have eight unless you continue down this way for eight and things would be maybe in the wrong location. Yeah. So remember that double bond and triple bond, kind of like when you uh, count it, when you're naming it uh, should be part of the longest chain. So you want to make sure it is part of the longest chain. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Uh, lastly here we have cyclobutane. So that is uh, four carbons. I'm going to go with the square ish type structure. And ENE -E means there's a double bond. Doesn't really matter where you lay it up. I'm going to lay it up there. And uh, we know that that has to be carbon number one on either side of it. So I'm going to call that carbon one, which means I do need to go through the bond there to carbon number two, down to carbon number three, where I'll have my methyl group in that case. If you really want to do condensed, uh, you would have CH, CH, uh, CH, actually. <laughs> and CH2, and a CH3. There you go, something like that, I think. Uh, and put the double bond in there would help, I probably imagine, there you go. Any questions on that there? Questions on how to draw them, all right, like that. So we're same way as what we did with alkanes, always go backwards whenever you have the name, you gotta draw it. Start with just the basic carbons, leave the hydrogens to the end and just fill in everything else and then get to four bonds with hydrogen. Any questions? All right. So uh, here we talked about cycloalkenes. And again, as you can see here, we will call this uh, carbon one. We need to go through the double bond to get to our group. And again, that is how they get to three methyl cyclopentene. And obviously here, uh, since we sort of did a number of these already, there's nothing attached here. This is going to be cyclohexene because of the double bond. Once again, we don't need to give the location because there's nothing else attached. It's assumed, obviously, again, that that's carbon number one. Here, uh, the largest uh, group is this ring here, which is a five-member ring. And this is going to be the base of cyclopentene. Now, we do have two methyls hanging out there, right? We got a methyl group there and a methyl group there. And that means we have two methyl groups in the same compound. So that is going to be a dimethyl situation, right? We do need to give the number here. So remember, we do have to start numbering at the double bond, which means if we go this way, that would be carbon two and that would be carbon three, right? When we get there. 
The only other option would be to start here at carbon number one. Again, we have to go through the bond to carbon two, carbon three, carbon four, and carbon five, which is going to be obviously a larger number in that case. So the correct number here is three for that, both methyl groups. I give the number once or twice? Twice, separated by a comma. Yeah, so this is going to be a three comma three dimethyl cyclopentene. Any questions on that one there? So again, uh, although you may be tempted to uh, number away from the double bond, just remember you always have to go through it. Um, and again, you're still looking for the smallest number, but you got to definitely kind of go through it. All right. All right. So that brings up this idea of isomers, which we've talked about previously, which are basically the same formula, but sort of different connectivity. And when we have a double bond, it actually does a couple of things. And what it actually does is one of the things it actually will do is it essentially will lock everybody into play. So what I mean by that is if you have an alkane, which are single bonded, carbons and you have something attached to it the actual bond between the two carbons you could rotate around it 360 degrees and just keep going around and around which is technically why you could draw you know the thing up or you could draw the group down it doesn't really matter because it has free rotation around the single bond when you lock in a double bond to the situation what ends up happening is you no longer are able to freely rotate the carbons around in a circle, basically. They get locked into place. And what that ends up doing is it will lock whatever groups are attached to that carbon in place. They'll either be basically above the double bond or they'll be below the double bond is sort of what you sort of think about it. And that brings about cis or trans isomers Cis means that they are on the same side of the double bond. So either they're both up the groups or they're both below the groups, the double bond. And trans means opposite sides of the double bond. So for example, if we look at this little simple example I have here, and actually I'll just move these guys up and down. I'll do D. Now, if A, B, and D here are groups attached to those carbons, there is a couple of really important things to look at if you're trying to decide whether or not there could be a cis or trans isomer actually occurring. So there are two things that you really have to look at to determine if it's even possible to have a cis or trans isomer. It is possible not to have a cis or trans isomer when you have a double bond. So when you look at the double bond, the first thing that you want to look at is on the same carbon in the double bond, are those groups different? So do you have different groups on the same carbon in the double bond on both sides? So if the answer is yes, when I look at the carbon on the left, it's got like A and B. When I look at the carbon on the right, it's got A and D. Those are different groups on each carbon in the double bond. That's good for cis or trans to actually happen. The second thing you have to obviously look at is, is there a same group on opposite carbons? So in this case, there is a same group on opposite carbons. There's A on this guy, and on the opposite carbon, there's also A, right? So those are the two things that you have to look at to determine if it's possible to even have cis or trans isomers. By the way, this one would be cis or trans. That is both answers, cis and trans. One of them should be right, I hope, yeah? The group that's in common on opposite carbons, which is A, right? Is it on the same side or opposite sides of the double bond? It's on the same side, right? They're both above the double bond, basically. It is as simple as that. They're either both drawn above the double bond or below the double bond. And this would be a cis 
situation, I guess, in terms of an isomer. If I had uh, this, this would be a cis or trans double bond. It would be a trans double bond. Again, different group, different group, different group, different group, similar group on opposite ones. And one's above the double bond and one's below the double bond. Opposite sides of the double bond is a trans, yeah? By the way, if I had this, Is cis or trans? The answer is neither. <laughs> and I'll say it again. It is neither. <laughs> so what is the first thing that you have to look at to see if it's possible for it to be cis or trans? The groups on the carbons need to be the same or different? They need to be different on the same carbon, right? So when I look at this carbon, that's an A, that's an A, that's the same group. Right off the bat, no cis or trans possible because of that. Now, although we do have a group that's the same on opposite carbons and also correctly on the same side, because that carbon on the left there has the same group attached, top and bottom, cannot have cis or trans. So you cannot always have cis or trans, and those are, again, the things that you have to kind of look at to determine that question on that there. All right, so here again, uh, we have this guy here. If we look at it up here and I draw it, now only when you're kind of doing cis and trans isomers, uh, do you uh kind of consider hydrogen a group, and in this case, first off. You pretty much just want to think about the double bond. And if we look at the carbon on the left, that is a CL, that is an H. Those are different things. And if we look at the carbon on the right, that's a CL, that's an H. Those are different things. So that is good for cis and trans to occur. Now we need to look for something that's the same on both carbons. And in this case, you could actually choose the hydrogen or the chlorine, but we'll look at the chlorine. And those guys are on the same side of the double bond. So this would be our cis, right? Now, if we drew the other one that's there. Again, uh, isolating the double bond here. That and that is different. This guy and this guy is different. So that allows us to have cis or trans. When we look at, say, the chlorines, for example, they are on opposite sides of the double bond. One's up, one's down, and that would be our trans. How do we incorporate that into the name? Well, frankly, you write cis in front of the name, or you write trans in front of the normal name that you do, and you just name it normally. So this guy here would be trans one two dichloral ethane. Ethene, I'm sorry, ethene in this case. And the top guy would be cis. Uh, one to you, dichloroethane. You basically just pop the cis or the trans in front of the name, basically. And if you see the cis or trans basically in front of the name, that tells you that's how they kind of want you to draw it, showing it uh, is either kind of above or below in the cis or trans sort of confirmation. All right. And here we go. Here is cis to butene. Now, if you were going to, for example, if you were going to draw cis to butene, and this was the name they gave you, and you needed to draw it to kind of show its uh, cis or trans geometry, if you will, the what I would recommend doing is actually drawing two structures, and the first structure would be really just like normal, just draw it like normal, forget about the cis or even forget about the trans. And if I would do this like normal, butene would tell me I need four carbons, right? 
ENE tells me it's a double bond and two means that it is a double bond at carbon number two. Like normal, everything else here is going to be hydrogens. This would be three hydrogens. This guy right here would actually be one hydrogen. And I would actually, for example, just kind of draw the hydrogen out so you could see it. And then we would have this guy here. So now that you just kind of drew it kind of straight like you normally would draw it, what I would then go back to you is just frankly isolate the carbon-carbon double bond and start with that. Because when we look at the carbon on the left, we basically have this group and this group attached. So you could clearly see the groups attached. And the carbon on the right, that's a group and that's a group. So if you want to go and draw this showing it as cis, what you would do is simply just draw the double bond part. And now we're going to do cis. So you can put your CH3 up on top and your H on the bottom. And then you would put your CH3 up on top and your H on the bottom. And now you have it drawn as cis. So sometimes it's helpful just to draw it like normal. Isolate the double bond. Make sure you kind of figure out what the four groups are. And then just start by redrawing the double bond. And if you need to put them cis, just put them both up or both down. If you need to do trans, we could also do trans in a second as well. Uh, you would just, again, start with the double bond. Since it's trans, one CH3 would go up on top, one H would go on the bottom. We know the CH3 needs to go in the opposite spot. And now we have it drawn as trans. So a lot of times it's easier just to draw it without the cis or trans and then kind of put it into cis or trans if you have to draw it that way. Any questions on that there? Yeah. Just like a question. Yeah. When you said what you said. Yeah, so we're gonna talk about some reactions in a second, but uh, it basically just gives you the location of the groups in relationship to uh, the double bond. And because of the double bond, you don't have that rotation. So what actually happens is it does lock those guys into those positions and it will give them some different properties depending if it's cis or trans because those guys can't freely rotate around and just kind of become the other guy. And it will give these guys some different properties depending if it's like the cis isomer or the trans isomer because they're kind of locked into place and it's very real life and stuff. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> All right. So here uh, we got to name some, and like I said, we'll just put basically cis or trans. We would name everything else like normal here. This is line structure, and you can see both of the bromines where our double bond would be is up, so that is cis. This would be our double bond here, one above the double bond, one below the double bond basically in that case, and that would be our trans uh, isomer in this case. All right. So for each of these, decide if they're cis or trans. And while you're at it, why don't you also name them? It's uh, cis or trans is one. It is cis. Uh, we have uh, different group, different groups. So that's good. Similar groups. You could also look at the methyl groups as well. And that would be cis. Longest carbon chain on this one is? It is four. And it is uh, one, two, three, and four. Sometimes when people are asked to name this, they just look at the double bond and always go with two. Yes, so long as carbon chains, all four of those. That is our friend uh, butene. And the double bond here would be at carbon number two, no matter which way you go, basically. So that is two butene. And we got a dichloral. So that is a three, I'm sorry, a two, three dichloral. And I'll just dash it in there, two butene. And to finish it out, this would be cis, right? Two, three dichloral, two butene. Again, sometimes when people see it drawn in cis or trans, all they do is focus in on the middle two carbons and everybody ends up with just two carbons yeah so you got to still do the longest carbon chain b is a 
trans, opposite sides. You could also look at the carbon if you like as well, the CH3s. Uh, again, here, we also have two different groups on each side. So once again, the longest carbon chain here is also one, two, three, and four. So again, we have a two butene, and this will end up as trans two, three, dibromal dash. Uh, I'll just go on the bottom here. Uh, we got uh, two butene. Any questions on that one there? Bottom one is, it is trans. You can look at the methyls. You can also look at the hydrogens if you really want to. Uh, this guy would be what name? Longest carbon chain is still four. Nothing else there but hydrogens, right? So this is actually just trans to butene. Questions on any of those there? The one I drew on top, trans, cis, trans, neither. This one is, if we look at the double bond, that's a group and that's a group. So that looks opposite to me. And that's going to be a trans. Yeah. The name of this guy would be? Longest carbon chain is? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, all the way across. Nothing else there but hydrogens. So this is trans. Where, where did I lay out that double bond there? One, two, three. It's actually three no matter which way you go. So this is trans three x Yeah. Question on that there. How about the last one? Cis, trans, neither? It is neither, and it's neither because when we look at this carbon, the double bond, that guy and that guy are the same. So neither. None. Any questions? Are cis, trans, how to identify them, how to name them? Again, be careful when naming. Make sure you do get the longest carbon chain. I'm sorry, say again? The groups do, but in the case of uh, A and B, uh, the only groups there are chlorines in the first one and bromines in the second one. Now, what you're probably thinking is the methyls are groups, but they're not groups because they're actually part of the longest carbon chain, if that's your question. between say, So if you're thinking this is a group in the sense of cis or trans, but when you go to name it, it's actually part of the longest carbon chain. So it's actually not a group in terms of the name. And that's why the only groups are actually there are the two chlorines at the top one. Yeah. And that's the same thing with the second one here. Although we do call these guys kind of groups when we're doing cis or trans. Once we sort of identify as cis or trans, we get rid of them as groups. And then we just go back to our normal way of naming, which again is one carbon, two carbons, three carbons, four carbons, which actually takes care of those methyl groups. And then that means that really the only true groups that are there are the bromines in this case. And that's also why here, although we kind of consider hydrogen groups when we're doing cis or trans, when we do our longest carbon chain, they're not really groups either at the end when you go to actually name it. So we kind of think of things as groups when we're trying to identify cis or trans, but when we go to name it still, we still want to go find that longest carbon chain. And if those groups are part of that longest carbon chain, then they're named as part of the longest carbon chain. They want to be groups when you go to name it. Other questions? <clears throat> okay. So we'll talk a little bit about here. I like that I got a page. <laughs> Let's talk about some reactions that uh, alkenes undergo. And alkenes undergo what are referred to as addition reactions. And addition reactions are different than substitution reactions because in a substitution reaction, like we saw with alkanes, uh, the bromine comes on, the hydrogen comes off, they replace each other basically. 
addition is pretty much what it sounds like. We're just going to add everybody in. Nobody's coming off. We're just going to put everybody on, basically, an addition. So the simplest idea here of how this works is pretty much this. We could add something, let's go with hydrogen, H2. By the way, this is what is known as a hydrogenation reaction because we're adding hydrogen. Now, what always happens when you have an addition reaction with an alkene, the only thing that you should ever focus in on is right there. That is the only thing that changes, okay? So what's going to happen in this case is we're actually going to add a hydrogen in to both sides of that double bond. And that's why it's called an addition. Nobody's coming off. We're just putting everybody on. Now, as it stands right now, if we look at the double bond on the left-hand side, do those carbons have room for anything to attach? Or they already have four bonds? They already have four bonds, which means we can't just slap the hydrogens on there. Otherwise, they each will have five bonds. So what always happens in these type of reactions when you have a double bond is simply the very first thing you should absolutely positively do is draw exactly what you have on the left-hand side. And the only difference you should do is just get rid of the double bond and make it a single bond. And you shouldn't overthink it. It should take you a matter of like 30 seconds just to copy what's there exactly like it is, except double bond becomes single. Yeah. Now, why does it become a single? Because now the carbons on the right-hand side have room for those hydrogen. And now what's left is we just drop in a hydrogen onto, I'll draw a different color, each of the carbons. They do not go on the same carbon. They go on different carbons, yeah? Now, if you don't want to add hydrogen, you could also add a halogen. Say something like Br2. So what's going to happen in this case? Same thing. This should be my only concern. I'm going to redraw it exactly the way it is, it's just going to lay me up a single bond there. So, single bond. Now, each of those carbons have room for a bromine on each of them, right? This is what is referred to as a symmetrical addition reaction, which frankly means you can't screw it up because you're adding the same thing in. Basically, everybody's the same thing that gets added in. Now, you may be saying, can't be that simple. Well, it, it should be that simple, I hope. So what else I had something that looked like this, maybe? Get me up there. Why not? All right, so let's say I had something like this. Fix my double bond there. And I want to add Br2 to it, right? The only place I should be concerned with is where the double bond's located, right? And the first thing I should do is just draw it exactly the way it is. And in this particular case, I'm going to actually just uh, draw the hydrogens out so we can kind of see them. I'm going to also make that into obviously a single bond there. And again, I'm just going to draw the hydrogens out. And now what should I do with my BRs? One should go here, right? And one should go here. And that's all they wrote there, yeah. So let's say you have this. only place I should be concerned with here is the functional group, basically the double bond. I know all I have to do, frankly, 
is I have pretty much my answer right there. I should just copy it. Don't overcomplicate it. Like I said, just copy it exactly the way it is. Again, this is what I was talking about earlier. Nothing funny happens. It doesn't become a ring or anything weird like that because it looks more chemistry-like. It basically will just do what it needs to do. Again, we want to turn that double bond into a single bond. And we're going to put everybody in there. So again, just basically copied what I had, laid my double bond into a single bond. And now I have room for both of my hydrogens to come on. Once again, they do come on to different carbons, one to each of the carbons in the double bond originally. This goes from an alkene, right? And you do this hydrogenation reaction, you get an alkane, yeah. So from an alkene to an alkane, that is what it is mean when it says it's partially hydrogenated. Yes, they added some hydrogens and got rid of some double bonds. So it makes your oil into margarine rather than butter, right? Or oil as it was in that particular case. Now, these are symmetrical addition reactions. There's also unsymmetrical addition reactions where you're actually adding two different things. And just to finish on showing you how that sort of works, and we'll do some more examples next time. But uh, if you have something like this and we add something like HCl, and actually, you know what, I'll actually make a, uh, let me make uh, one more carbon on that, actually. Let me do this. I could illustrate that. All right, let's do this guy here. This is what is sometimes referred to as an unsymmetrical addition because you're adding H and Cl as opposed to in the first one, we're adding two Brs, two Hs, and stuff like that. So in this case, it works the same way. We still want to focus in on our double bond. We still want to turn that double bond into a single bond. So just going to copy it exactly the way it is. Keep everybody where they were at. Now, when you have this type of unsymmetrical addition, when you're adding hydrogen and something else, it happens like HCl, HBr, by the way, water, which is H and OH is kind of the same idea as that, or like HBr. The hydrogen will end up, in this case, when there is a difference, when you look at this carbon, in the double bond, how many hydrogens are directly attached to that carbon? One, yeah, the guy on the bottom. When we look at the carbon over here, how many hydrogens are directly attached to it? Two, yeah, one on top, one on the bottom, right? So when you have this type of addition, the hydrogen, which is known as Markovnikov's rule, that's a mouthful, will always end up at the carbon that started with the most hydrogen. So in this case, the carbon on the right started with the most hydrogens. That is the one that gets the hydrogen. The other carbon gets the other guy, which would be the Cl in this case, yeah? And that will give you your product. So the hydrogen, when you're adding hydrogen and like water, so H and OH for water, H and Cl or H and Br, the hydrogen will always end up on the carbon that was in that double bond that had the most hydrogens to start with. And then the other guy will end up on the other carbon. The reason is to walk all unsymmetrical is because of that, you're adding two different things as opposed to the other one, you can't mess it up because you're adding two BRs. So it doesn't matter which one you put on which carbon, they're both the same thing. Or you're adding two hydrogens, so both the same thing. So it doesn't really matter. But this one, it does matter where the hydrogen ends up. If there is a difference in the number of uh, hydrogens that are on there, the original one that I had before I erased it, which was this, and if you added like water to it, there is no difference. So you could actually do it any way you want in this case in terms of how many hydrogens. You would still break the bond. You would leave the hydrogens here that was there. And in this case, you could put the H on this side and the OH on that side. It doesn't really matter because there is no difference in terms of the hydrogen you started with. That, by the way, when you add water to an alkene, you get an alcohol, which is what that guy is there on the right in that case. Any questions? I will do more examples next.